Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Christian Skeptic. I'm your host, Sean Kerwin, and as always, it's my mission to take an honest look at our questions about Christianity through the lens of logic and reason. I'm not here to preach at you, just to start a conversation with you. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to The Christian Skeptic. It has been a while since I've recorded an episode. I have received messages from some of you asking, am I okay? Is another episode coming? Um, Yes, I'm okay. Another episode is here. I took a season off from recording this podcast uh, because I like to put some research into it and some work into it. And the past several months of my life have been very busy. Um, My wife and I bought a house that ended up being a little bit more of a project than we thought we were going to get ourselves into, but... By the grace of God, we have some of the most amazing friends that rallied around us and picked up hammers and drills and paintbrushes, and we got to work. And it was uh, one of the most amazing things I've ever witnessed, uh, this gift of friendship that we have. And secondly, I completed a master's thesis this past fall that demanded almost all of my free time and attention, but I have since completed that and passed with an A, uh, which felt really, really good. And maybe that's a little more detail than you care to know on a Christian skeptic podcast, but nevertheless, that is my excuse for having not recorded an episode in a while. So if you'll forgive me for that, we can press forward to today's episode, which is are Christmas trees pagan? And more specifically, do Christmas trees have pagan origins? So I figured we'd start off this next season, if you will, of The Christian Skeptic with a little lighthearted, but also kind of serious because we all know that Christian. Maybe it's a weird Christian aunt or grandparent or parent or just a weird Christian from church that is like, you know, you shouldn't put up Christmas trees because those came from pagan traditions and, and... so is that true? <laughs> should we should we talk about that? And I think we should. Again, this episode will be a little more lighthearted in nature. So if you are super serious and bah humbugging right now, then maybe listen to a different episode. But if you're up for the adventure for a little bit of lighthearted uh, Christmas tree pagan origin discussion, as well as other pagan origin discussions in the Bible, because, spoiler alert, the Bible's actually full of them, then stay tuned to this episode. So do Christmas trees have pagan origins? Yes, they do. I mean, of, of course they do. We, we have history documenting that the Romans would use pine trees uh, as a part of their winter solstice celebration and their Saturnalia celebrations to honor the god Saturn. And, and I don't know about honor, if that's necessarily the right word, historians are kind of on the fence about, as it seems, as I found in my research, that whether these trees were used as a part of the worship system or they were just simply decoration, as we know, in the wintertime, a lot of trees shed their leaves and pine trees do not. And so they are really good to decorate with in the winter if you want to uh, spruce up, no pun intended, your home with some greenery. And so we do we do have history of the Romans doing that. We have history of the Egyptians doing that with pine trees as well. And Interestingly enough, we have history of the Egyptians. Again, it's debated on whether it was actually used a part of pagan worship or just some decorations around that time, but we do know that Egyptians used palm branches as a part of pagan worship. And so that's very interesting because right right away we run into our first other pagan conflict in scripture is that there's this prophet named Zechariah, and he foretold of the Messiah coming to Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, and Jesus, you know, saddles up on this donkey and rides into Jerusalem, and the people start to declare him king, start to declare him Messiah, and they do so by laying palm branches at his feet. In Christian tradition, we call the Sunday before Easter Palm Sunday, and (laughs) it has pagan origins. It was the Egyptians that first implemented the use of laying palm branches at the feet of a deity as a part of a pagan worship system. So that's a problem that we celebrate something with pagan origins, right? If the Christmas tree thing is a problem as well. And so, okay, well, palm branches, maybe we can forgive that. You know, there is Palm Sunday. It's Christian tradition. It was pointing back to Jesus. But we have other pagan traditions noted in Scripture. One of the worst offending pagan traditions that we 
know of in the New Testament is the use of Greek and Roman philosophical thought that James, Paul, John, and Peter are all very guilty of. I think this is most evident in John's gospel. John chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In the Greek, that, that word, word, is logos. Enarche and hologos is the Greek. In the beginning was the Word. And John is very famously playing off of Aristotelian philosophy in this idea of a logos, that behind everything is a thought. And so John capitalizes the lambda and basically personifies the Logos. And he says, no, behind everything is a thinker and his name is Jesus. But in doing so, John uses pagan origin of thought, the, the dirty sinner he is. My gosh, Paul stands up in the Areopagus, right, and says, you have a statue of an unknown God. I'm here to tell you, I know that God. Paul, what are you doing, man? That, was a, that thought was had pagan origins. James, in his gospel, he lays out, uh, and not, not his gospel, sorry, in his letter, he lays out this train of thought, and it's it's a philosophical, uh, almost proverbial train of thought where he has some ideas of how to live a Christian life, right? And he says, you know, uh, faith without works is dead, and he goes on to talk about that. And it's like, James, what are you doing, man? That's that that train of thought has pagan origins. You dirty, dirty sinner, right? <laughs> uh, and well, it's even worse than that too, because so James does that with this like kind of new law of. What does the what, what are the works that are the fruit of faith? And he lays this out, right? And, and so for centuries now, Christians have looked at that and said, you know, yes, by grace and the faith of that grace that Jesus Christ gave on the cross, Christians are saved. But how do we know? Well, James comes in like the, the freaking stud he is and lays out this list. But he does so in a way that pagans typically did so. And then worse than that, Moses did the same freaking thing. Deuteronomy. When you look at the book of Deuteronomy, it reads like an ancient pagan contract or constitution that would govern pagan societies. As a matter of fact, when you compare Deuteronomy to the Code of Hammurabi, which was written hundreds of years before Deuteronomy, there is a direct literary correlation between the Code of Hammurabi and Deuteronomy as far as construction, didactics, and linguistics that are utilized. And then even worse than that, <laughs> as if it could get worse, right? So now Deuteronomy has pagan origins. So we, we, we need to throw that one out too. Worse than that, the Ark of the Covenant is perhaps the, the thing, the symbol in the Bible with the deepest pagan origins. And, and it's kind of interesting, right? Because so the children of Israel leave Egypt and they're instructed to make this box, this worship box. And the word Ark that we have in Hebrew it comes from like a furniture type word, so like a dresser or uh, a, a table. So, so when you think of the Ark of the Covenant, it's in, the language is intended to identify it as a piece of furniture. And there's no pushback from the Israelites of this is kind of weird, this is kind of new. We don't we don't have any evidence culturally of other pagans coming to Israel and saying, "What's this weird dresser you're carrying around?" right? <laughs> is this, does this have something to do with your God? And we don't have that because the pagan world carried their gods in arcs. As, as a matter of fact, we have archaeological evidence of the Egyptians long before the Exodus is supposed to have been written, and archaeologists believe it's been written. We have evidence of Egyptians carrying Ra and Horus and Osiris in these little worship boxes, these arcs of their gods. And so Ark of the Covenant sounds like such a holy word to us because we're so far removed from it from history, but it's literally just the worship box of the people of this covenant, this, this law, this, this, this deal that God made to say, I'll save you from slavery, but then you got to follow me and here's some tablets I'm going to send down on a mountain. This is this deal we're making. So it's the worship box of the people of the deal. That might be a better way to think about Ark of the Covenant. But the idea of a worship box is not new. The Egyptians were putting their gods in worship boxes. Now, an interesting thing about the Ark of the Covenant is that there's no God in there. There's just a mercy seat. And that has, obviously, deep biblical significance when you think about the mercy seat. And you think about God not being contained in the box. That God is the pillar of smoke and pillar of fire that guides them. And, but, but the worship boxes 
from both the Ark of the Covenant and Egyptian archaeology were adorned and ornamented and decorated with things that would describe their gods. So, for example, you have Ra, who's the god of the sun. So his worship box on both the outside and the inside would have ornaments and decorations and carvings into it that showed elements of Ra's power as god of the sun. And so similarly, then, the Ark of the Covenant does the same thing with Yahweh. The Ark of the Covenant, particularly, I'm not going to go into detail on that. I mean, there is plenty of literature <laughs> in the Torah describing the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus. But say, suffice to say that that mercy seat is the most defining characteristic of Yahweh in the Ark of the Covenant. And that that then becomes the vehicle through which Israel places their sacrifices on and, and, and the Ark goes before them in battle. And the pagans did this all too, which is fascinating. And so what then do we say to these things? Well, I think we have to talk about what does it mean to have a pagan tradition and do we fully reject it? You see, I have a friend who's a Seventh-day Adventist, and it's interesting that he always argues that worship on Sunday is invented by the pagans, it's invented to worship the sun god, and Christians shouldn't worship on Sunday. And I mean, let's be real, the Seventh-day Adventists are a cult pretty much anyway, so fair enough. But it's interesting because now we have to, <laughs> we have to reconcile with this idea that some of the most holy things in Scripture, as I just pointed out, come from pagan traditions, or do they? And so, as I was kind of thinking about this, I wanted to kind of challenge the way we think about pagan traditions and the sinful things of the world, because just there's, there's a contrast there now, right? Where it's like, we're supposed to be in the world, not of it. We're supposed to be holy, which really that word just means set apart, different, and, and, and set apart to what? Well, set apart to the goodness and glory of God, of Yahweh, of Jesus, and so there's a standard as to what that looks like, right? And, and the standard manifests itself in a law. And then the law was fulfilled in Christ, and now there's grace. And so we go back to James, right? And okay, so what does it look like to be a Christian and to live under the law of grace, which means you don't have to obey everything because Jesus paid the price, he fulfilled the law, but you get to obey everything. And if you've really received Jesus, you'll look like you want to obey everything. And maybe not just look like it, you'll actually want to. And and maybe there's no difference there, because I think if you look like you want to, and you actually want to, I, I don't think you can look like you want to if you don't want to, at least not truly and not in a long-term timeline. So, okay, if you're still tracking with me, <laughs> back to this idea that the pagan traditions, the Ark of the Covenant, the Code of Hammurabi, Aristotelian philosophical thought, palm branches, and heck, even the cross, all have origins in pagan culture, tradition, religion, decoration, practices. Or do they? So, I think a biblical look at anthropology is needed in order to have this discussion as far as what is pagan, what is acceptable, what is not, can I put up a Christmas tree? Can I hang ornaments on a Christmas tree? Can I put an angel on a Christmas tree? What does any of this mean for how I'm going to celebrate Christmas here in like a week? Well, biblical anthropology finds its first principle, which is, again, more Aristotelian thought, right? So Aristotle has this idea of logic and that there's first principles you have to establish within a given logical system in order to understand that system. So if you want to look that up, feel free to. I'm not going to explain it in any more depth here. But the first principle of biblical anthropology is that man once walked with God in the garden and then screwed it up. And so if we take that first principle then, part of that is that man was made in the image of God, that man was made to walk with God in the garden. And then we screwed it up. It got perverted. Thorn and thistle and sin and lies and the knowledge of good and evil entered the world. But if man was made to do that, then the desire is still there. There's a biological drive that's still there. And we know that there are certain biological tendencies we can't get away from. Whether you subscribe to evolutionary biology or not, there are principles in evolutionary biology that ring true, no matter what you believe. That there are instincts within each one of us that under certain circumstances will take over. So for example, when threatened, it's been noted, and this should be you know, very easy to understand, we have a fight or flight response, and that's a survival instinct. 
If the option to flee and get away from danger is present, we'll take that response as a survival instinct. If we have to fight our way out of danger in order to survive, we will take that response as a survival instinct because that's, that's an instinct built into our biology. So I submit to you that walking with God in the garden is an instinct built into our biology and that any pagan tradition we have is something that has taken that instinct and twisted it, right? Because I think that's the argument then. Where if we say the Christmas tree is pagan, or worshiping on Sundays is pagan, um, or you know if we actually were to really think it out and dig deeper, we would say the Ark of the Covenant, the cross, Palm Sunday, the Gospel of John, the Book of James, anything written by Paul, Deuteronomy, the entire law, all has pagan origins. We all need to throw it out. Thinking at all has pagan origins. Let's just sit there and wait for God to return and tell us what to do. It's pretty stupid, and it's not going to happen. But, but you need to follow that train of thought out if you're going to say something has pagan origins and we need to reject all of it. Well, because what you're saying is Christians are taking something pagan and they're twisting it to make it sound holy, right? Like, like that's the statement at the end of the day. How dare you, Moses? You're taking this pagan worship box and you're twisting it to make it sound holy. What, you just want power? You just want a bunch of complaining Israelites who give you nothing but grief just to follow you around the desert for 40 years? <laughs> John, you're taking Aristotle's philosophy and this common language that everyone can understand. You're twisting it to make it sound holy. Like you, you just want you just want non-Jews to like to follow this Jesus person. How dare you, Paul too? Like you just want everybody to hear this gospel. <laughs> and so you're gonna twist. You're, you're gonna take this pagan thing and twist it and make it sound all holy. <laughs> And it sounds silly, right? So what if instead of looking at it that way, we look at it and say, no, the Egyptians took this idea of a worship box, this idea of a physical thing that you, you could shoulder. You could shoulder the burden of representing God. You could shoulder the burden of representing heaven and the mercy seat. And it could be a vessel that you can reclaim some of that connection of walking with God. The Egyptians took that and they twisted it. Look, the Bible says since the beginning of time, Christ was predestined to die on a cross. And so from the beginning of time, God had this, had this vision of Jesus riding in low on a donkey into Jerusalem and people laying palm branches at his feet. And maybe, just maybe, the Egyptians longed to lay palm branches at the feet of, of a true king, God, who would sit on the throne. And, and so they took this thing of walking with God and they twisted it. Maybe Aristotle loved the gift of reason and volition, which I think is half of what it means to be made in the image of God, that we can reason and think. And he just wanted to reason and think, but he didn't want God, so he took that and he twisted it. And I don't know where this leaves the Christmas tree. That's silly, right? I, I think an argument can be made for the Christmas tree. I'll, I'll defend my little Christmas tree like Charlie Brown here for a second and say, I think some really good, thoughtful Christians and maybe some Christians frustrated with the world. Cause I also think that's kind of funny, right? Where it's like, I feel like there's a stereotype. And if you get offended at this, forgive me, but some of you are going to understand this and you're like, like you're going to be with me on this thought, right? But there's a stereotype where it's like the Christians that are the ones that are offended at Christmas trees are also stereotypically the ones that are kind of just like, Oh, you know, culture is just going the way of the devil right now. And everyone's, everyone's so corrupt and no one honors God and we need revival. And, and I'm just going to get in my little prayer circle and, and, and you should have a prayer circle. I'm not saying don't, but you, you got what I'm saying, right? Where it's like the Christians that are talking about the Christmas trees being pagan are the ones that just complain about culture the most. And maybe God wants us to be in the world, not of it, because we can look at statues of unknown gods. We can look at Aristotle's philosophy. We can look at Egyptian worship boxes and say, guys, you're so freaking close. Can I point you to how to use that properly? Can I point you to, to the beauty that lies in between and within the thing you're using, but, but you're just, you're skewing it. You've twisted it. And let me, can I, can I help you untwist and unravel it? Can we take a moment and say the world is screwed up and that there's so many things wrong with it, but we all, for some reason, pause every 12 months and hang up these dead trees on posts in the ground and we decorate them with lights that's kind of representative of the light of the world and we hang ornaments, ornaments that we make and ornaments that we decorate, ornaments that represent who we are, things that we've done for the year, and we hang them on this dead tree that also has the light of the world hanging on it. And under the tree are free gifts. 
Can we not see how there's some beauty in between the lines that we read in our culture every single day that you can't bring the Bible into every workplace or school, but you can bring a Christmas tree into it. And maybe we can just point to someone and say, that is the most beautiful thing that, that we put on the calendar. You know why? Because it represents the cross that the light of the world hung on and everything I am, I count as lost because it's all hanging on that cross too, like Paul said. And it's a free gift that, that at the foot of the cross are free gifts of grace. And yeah, it's silly. And yeah, it's just a Christmas tree. And yeah, half of them are fake now anyway. I have a fake one. Got it on Amazon. No shame. <laughs> but it's Christmas. And, you know, thinking about it, this thought just popped in my head. This is the first Christmas-themed episode I think I've done. So it's a funny one to kind of get back into the swing of recording podcasts with. But maybe the thought behind the Christmas tree is that there's beauty in between the lines that we read every single day in culture. And that instead of condemning people that see the world and the beauty in the world in a different way than we do, maybe we can try to get behind their vantage point and start to untwist and unravel some of the ways that beauty gets twisted. Now, certainly this doesn't apply to every pagan tradition, so please don't mishear me. Pagans would also sacrifice children to false gods. Pagans would rape, abuse, and torture women to the tune of false gods. We know that the land of Canaan did that, right? We know that part of Israel taking over the land of Canaan was God after 800 years of the Canaanites being brutal and vicious in the name of pagan religion. He was finally going to judge them and right the wrongs and bring justice into the world. There are pagan traditions that have accounted for murders and, and, and rapes and horrible things in the world. And so please don't mishear me. There is a law. There are certain things that God has said that we can't unravel and untwist because they're not twisted things. They're just wrong. They're contrary things. And so we need to be wise and discerning about that. But maybe part of that wisdom and discernment is being quicker to understand than we are to judge. But I don't know. Let me know what you think. As always, feel free to write into the show. Reach out to me on social media. I promise I'll be a little more active these days now that life has slowed down a bit and isn't this intense, crazy race for me. But as always, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed the show.